Now, Francie, I, it, just seeing your paper and, and the fact you folks put this together and did what you did uh, makes it think. It makes me think it must be really fun uh, to do what you do at University of Washington. Uh, that that you and your colleagues got together and said, um, "Let's delve deep into the Waymac machine and invent a cool tool to allow us to do that and see what we find." Can you tell us how that all came to be? Yeah, no, uh, it is really fun. Um, one of the things I really like about working in security and privacy is that it's such a broad area and it touches all aspects of technology. So um, it definitely keeps things interesting. Um, so on the tracking work, um, web tracking and web privacy is something that we've been interested in um, for several years now. We had a paper on tracking back in 2012 um, looking just at tracking in the present at that time. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in tracking both from the academic research community and the media and policymakers and the public increasingly. Um, and last year or so, uh, when we started this project, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, what we realized was that there had been increasing numbers of studies on tracking, but they're all different and people use different methodologies and they're looking at tracking, you know, at a particular time. The natural way to study it, of course, is to study it on the live web today. Um, but what that doesn't really give us is a picture of how that ecosystem has changed over time um, and how uh, user privacy is impacted, how company practices have changed over time. And so that, that was that was the question is, can we get a more comprehensive view of this ecosystem um, and study the changes? And then the Wayback Machine, which is the Internet Archive, um, it's at archive.org. Um, that's something that, you know, we're not affiliated with. That's an archive that exists and it has data reaching back to 1996. And so our question was, well, hey, can we use this existing archive um, of all, you know, all the popular sites on the web to actually study this question? Did you have trouble at all with, uh, I'm not sure what the methodology is um, for maintaining the Internet Archive, um, capturing the old websites and then um, keeping different copies of that site at different times so that you can track it back through time. Did you have trouble with um, the integrity of any of the data that you were looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So the... Um the archive is great. It has tons of data, especially for popular websites, um, you know, like CNN, for example. Um, they're snapshotting that site, you know, many times a day. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it has tons of data. Um, and there have been some prior studies looking at sort of the integrity of the archive in terms of our sites archived, um, you know, does, does their content reflect what was actually there and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that was tricky for us was that we aren't interested so much in like the content of the website as you would see as a user, um, but we're interested in kind of the underlying technical details of the site. So in particular, uh, when you visit a site like CNN.com, um, CNN is the site that as a user you've intentionally visited. It's the one that you see in your address bar. Um, but as that your browser is loading that page, it's talking to all sorts of other entities, which we call third parties. Um, and those are the ones that have the ability to track you. So those are advertisers or uh, social media buttons like the Facebook like button or uh, website analytics platforms. And to uh, you know, a regular user of the web, those are all invisible parties. And the goal of the Internet Archive um, was not to necessarily archive those aspects of those pages. Um, and so that for lots of different reasons, um, for a given archive of a page, um, even if we have the archive of kind of that top level page like CNN, there are various reasons why we might be missing some data um, in that kind of longer chain of requests that the browser is making. Um, so actually, you know, initially we had the idea of using the archive and it seems like a relatively straightforward idea. Um, one, one thing that makes the archive easy to use from a measurement perspective is that when you visit it um, and you look at a page, you know, like from 1996, your browser is still loading that page like it would load a normal page. So all of the techniques that we use to measure tracking, we can still use. Um, mm -hmm. 
So initially it seemed like it would be a straightforward process, but because the data is not always complete, um, you can have weird things happen where you might load a page um, and the archive has made some mistake in how it's put together that archive. And so you might get a page from 1996 that's showing an ad from 2004 or something like that. <laughs> uh, and so we had to understand all these different reasons that the data might not be perfect and try to convince ourselves uh, scientifically that the results we were seeing, like the trends of tracking increasing over time, were actually reflecting real trends and not just, um, you know, say because the archive got better over time at archiving pages. Right. Well, I, I take it you went into it with sort of the experimental bias that you were expecting to see. Um, tracking increasing over time. That just sort of seems commonsensical that that's what's happened. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that is, that is in fact what we found. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the reasons that um, it's, we felt it was worth doing that was kind of confirming that intuition. I don't think we mm -hmm. or really anyone else is terribly surprised by the fact that tracking has increased. Um, anybody who's been using the web probably has that sense. Um, but do you have any just, scary can, statistics to share with our listeners about uh, exactly the degree of how much tracking has increased just to sort of drive that home? Yeah. Um, so so because of the the fact that the archives data isn't perfect, I would sort of any of the numbers that we have, hmm. um, I would take with a grain of salt. Um, if anything, they're probably underestimates um, just because we are missing some data. Um, but for example, if we there's there's multiple ways that we can sort of measure how tracking has increased. Um, one of those ways is just to look at how many trackers there are, how many uh, entities are contacted while you're visiting pages. Um, so what we did is we actually looked at the top 500 websites, so the most popular 500 websites from each year, because those are the websites that you know by definition people most often visit. Um, so on those 500 websites. Um, in 2016, we see over 100 different trackers, different companies tracking, um, or at least appearing as third parties, compared to like one in 1996. Um, <laughs> so there's been, and, and that, that around 100 number um, is, like I said, it's an underestimate. If we look at data that we collect from the live web where we don't have any of the challenges of the archive, um, we can see over 400 of these. So. Um, so there, there are many, many companies um, that are involved in this complex ecosystem. Um, there are other ways that we can kind of measure how tracking has increased. Um, another is if, if you look at an individual site, like on average, how many trackers do these different sites include? And that's also increased. Mm -hmm. So back in 1996, you know, most sites didn't have trackers on them. Now, most sites, like 75% of sites we found have at least one uh, third party on them. And on average, they include multiple of them. So on average, they include about four. Um, and then the final thing that we look at is not, you know, those are kind of like how, how much is this going on? Um, but from a privacy perspective, what you're really interested in is for the most popular trackers, how much can they see of my browsing history? Mm -hmm. So if I visit, you know, CNN.com and then I visit the New York Times and the same tracker is present on both of those sites, then that tracker can kind of link that together and say, you know, this user might not know my name, but at least know that I'm the same user. This user has visited both of those sites. And so the question is, how big is this browsing profile that the trackers can create of you? Um, and so if we look at the, who are the most popular trackers, um, they appear on upwards of 30 or 40 percent of the top 500 sites uh, in 2016. Whereas in 1996, that just wasn't the case. There was the occasional third party here and there that was probably not intentionally uh, tracking in the way that these companies make it their business model today. Um, so, yeah, we've really seen a dramatic increase uh, in the last 20 years, even in the last 10 years. <laughs> 